it's been so long now since it happened. The person or persons that did this, they may already be dead. This is Julia Niswender. Ten years ago, someone came into her house and took her life in the most gruesome way imaginable. And who got into her home? Who wanted her dead? A few days later, she was face down in her own bathtub. The officers analyzed the crime scene and collected all the evidence they could. But to this day, the killer has not been caught. Was there a grave error made by the Ypsilanti police? Or is there a much darker truth lurking in the shadow? And then, when I asked her if she wanted to come home three days later, she said, no, I don't want to come home. Julia's cold case is truly a bumpy ride. There's a million plot twists and outrageous facts. Hopefully, they'll all amount to something soon. Something happened there. I don't know if she found out something or confronted them about something. I, I think he silenced her. But no matter the outcome, let's dive into the case of the girl who was killed and left in her bathtub to rot. Today's case takes place in a small town in Michigan called Ypsilanti. The name might be Greek, but the town is all American. It's got quiet suburban neighborhoods with big houses and lush forests. This is the place Julia Niswender spent her last few days, thinking she was safe. But this story begins in Monroe, another 20,000 people town in Michigan. This is where Julia grew up. She was born in January 1989, along with her twin sister Jennifer, to her mother, Kim Turnquist, and an unknown father. When I say unknown, there's a darker truth to it. Not even Kim knew him. I, I don't know if you know the whole story. Uh, I was when I was 14, I got pregnant and I ended up having twins, okay? So that's how the twins came about. Kim eventually remarried a man named Jim and had another daughter called Madison. But Julia and Jennifer didn't grow up with them. Because Kim had barely even started high school when she had the twins, her father ended up raising them. She was like a uh, like a daughter to me because the first 11 years that she was alive, I was uh, her legal guardian. Indeed, Julia spent most of her childhood years with her grandfather, James, Kim's dad. It was only after she turned 11 that she moved in with her mom and younger sister. Julia was a protector of Jennifer. I mean, that, you know, that's for sure. Um, and she was the more, I want to say, aggressive in the way, meaning, you know, don't mess with my sister because I'll take care of you. So Julia is that kind of person, like leave my sister alone. She was, I mean, she was that kind of person, but she also, you know, where she loved everyone and, and would, you know, fight for anyone that she cared about. Julia was a pretty feisty person who didn't shy away from getting what she wanted, but she was also a kind, friendly person who loved her family more than anything. In fact, her family remembers her as a happy-go-lucky girl who enjoyed spending quality time with her loved ones and wanted a normal life. She just wanted to go to school, work, and have a good time. After graduating from high school, Julia enrolled at Eastern Michigan University, where she was a student right to the horrific events in 2012. So Julia spent her last years between EMU and the off-campus apartment in Ypsilanti and her family home in Monroe. But her family home was not that simple, as Julia had three homes, Kim's, James, and her grandmother, Rose's. And during her time as a student, she would spend an awful lot of time at Rose's place. Julia did live with her grandmother. That was only at her choice. The part that um, some people got wrong was when Julia was 19, she was kicked out of the house. Indeed, it wasn't just Kim's house that only had two bedrooms, which were already occupied by Kim and Jim and the younger sister, Madison. But when Julia was in her freshman year of college, she got into a pretty nasty fight with her mom. One day, Julia and Jennifer were at the house bickering with each other, but the bickering escalated into a fight and the girls just wouldn't stop calling each other names. So Kim thought it was time to intervene at least for the sake of the little sister, who was hearing all of the bad words. And then Julia went into the bedroom, and I did say to her, Julia, if you don't shut your mouth and stop the arguing, I'm gonna smack it. Now remember, the twins are 19 years old. So they're not little kids, they're 19. They graduated high school. So she kept running her mouth, 
And so I went to like smack her mouth because I told her I was going to smack her mouth. She drew her fist back, and that's when Jim came in the room and said, oh, no, no one's going to hit my wife. She didn't hit me. Nothing ha else happened there except for I said, you know what? I said, get your stuff and get out. Julia had always been a feisty person, and she was pretty set on having the last word in any argument, except this is not very mature, nor does it lead to very good relationships. So when this behavior continued into her adult years, Kim was having less and less of it. But Julia didn't necessarily learn a lesson. She just decided to move in with her grandma and said Rose let her do anything she wanted. And then when I asked her if she wanted to come home three days later, she said, no, I don't want to come home. And I said, why, Julia? She goes, because grandma lets me do whatever I want. When she would come home from college, she did go to her grandma's and did stay there because she chose to. But even through the turmoil, Julia stayed very close to her twin sister, Jennifer. After all, they were twin sisters. The two truly felt connected in a special way, and they were each other's best friends. However, Julia and Jennifer were university students now, so of course they led separate lives, at least physically. They couldn't be together all the time, and they didn't always keep each other posted on every little thing they did. Which is why what happened next is still foggy to most of Julia's family. It was Thursday, December 6th, 2012, and the winter holidays were approaching fast. Julia was still at her EMU off-campus apartment, getting ready for a longer stay with her family. But before the actual Christmas break, Julia visited her family for the weekend but her mom already had a Christmas surprise for her. So I had been at work, Julia had come home. Then when we got off work, we went, me and Jim went and got a real Christmas tree because we wanted to surprise the girls. So we got the real Christmas tree on that Thursday. That's when we all got together. When Jennifer got off work uh, that night, we decorated the Christmas tree at our house, at the Turnquist house hot chocolate, we decorate the tree. So on Thursday evening, Julia, Jennifer, and the rest of the family decorated their Christmas tree and spent a nice evening together. The next day, Julia went over to Rose's place. According to James, the grandfather, Julia's decision wasn't made lightly. On Friday, Julia visited her mom at work. Then the two went shopping and came home together. He believes there was a big fight at the Turnquist house that evening making Julia want to leave the place and stay at her grandma's once more. Why does he say this? The minute Julia entered Rose's house, she said, I'm never going back to that house again. Later in the evening, Rose and Julia decorated Rose's Christmas tree. They were just mid-process when Kim dropped by. Kim said she was there to help with the tree, but all she did was sit down and listen to the two women talk. It's almost as if she wanted to see if Julia had told Rose about the fight. Friday before she got killed, December the 7th, Julie went over to Grandma Rose and made a statement, something to the effect that I'm never going back there again. Something happened. Everybody has their own theory. And it probably was in the afternoon whenever they, the family was decorating their Christmas tree at Kim and Jim's. That got Julie in the frame of mind when she went to her grandma's that she said, I'm never going back there again. A good friend of the twin sisters, Barbara Robinson, also commented on this supposed fight. Something happened there. I don't know if she found out something or confronted them about something. I, I think he silenced her. I think that was a, a, an entire, like, silence ploy. Yep. Barbara has a much darker suspicion than a simple fight. She believes the family was at least indirectly involved in Julia's murder. But when the YouTube channel Explore With Us confronted Jennifer about this, she denied having any sort of argument that night. Thursday, December 6th, the night we decorated, we didn't have any sort of argument or nothing decorating our tree. And then the no. next day was grandma's. There was no... And that's why I don't know where they're getting this from because even everybody there, my grandma, my aunt, my uncle were all there. And later, when Rose was interviewed, she rebuked the claim that Julia said she'd never go back to Kim's home. On Saturday, December 8th, Julia had to work. The last contact she had with her mom was on the night before. 
Kim worked in retail management, and she had a very different shift from Julia. She knew that she wouldn't speak to her the rest of the day. The last words that I had ever spoke to her was, Julia, I love you. And I said, be safe. On that Saturday, Julia went to work, and as soon as her shift was over, she went on a date. It's unclear whether this was Julia's very first date with this guy or if they'd been dating for a bit, but he was a very fresh addition to her life and her family didn't know about it. But during her Saturday work shift, Julia also saw her sisters, Jennifer and Madison. Yeah, we went, you know, that part of the story is true, we, you know, in, in the video as well. We did, me and my little sister did go up and see her and have lunch with her while she was working. She did walk me around and once she was done, she walked us out. Jennifer remembers it was a little odd that Julia didn't put her coat on when she walked to her sister's car. It was freezing cold outside. Maybe she was just rushing to get back to work or maybe her mind was somewhere else. Just before 11 p.m. that night, Jennifer spoke to Julia one last time. Julia was back at her EMU apartment studying for her final December exams. That was the last time Julia spoke to her family. In the early hours of Sunday, December 9th, Julia was killed. On Monday, December 10th, people started realizing Julia wasn't showing up. First, she missed her college classes, then she didn't show up at work. But her radio silence wasn't distressing to her family, at least not at first. So on that Monday, I hadn't talked to Julia. Jennifer didn't talk to her, which isn't uncommon to go a day or so without talking. That day, Kim says she went with Rose to get tested for lymphoma. I, with my mother, Rose, and uh, went to the cancer clinic, and I found out that I tested negative for lymphoma. The last text I ever sent Julia was a little quick text saying, something along the line like no lymphoma yay and i had never heard back from her and i did think it was kind of odd but i'm like oh she's probably in school or work yeah you don't think of the worst possible case scenario from the get-go to miss one day of school is no big deal either but julia would have let her colleagues know as for work she was always in contact with her bosses if she was as little as 10 minutes late there are claims that on Monday, Julia was also supposed to work at Jim's cleaning business. She did have a lot of cleaning supplies in her car trunk, and Barbara said, She told her aunt and grandma that she was working with them that morning. But opinions diverge, and no one knows for certain if this was in Julia's plans or not for the day. She did help him to earn money, but she wasn't scheduled that day. But Monday turned into Tuesday, and people still didn't hear from her. By now, her family knew something was terribly wrong. That was immediately a red flag for me, and my heart just started racing. The red flag became clear when Julia's Walmart colleagues went to her apartment to pick her up for a work party. She hadn't been answering her phone, nor had she been at work, so they figured they'd just check in on her. But although her car was parked in the driveway, she didn't answer the door. That's when they knew they had to do something. On December 11, 2012, Ypsilanti police were called and asked to go check Julia's apartment. When they came in, the first thing they checked was her bedroom. It was in disarray, with clothes and objects on the floor scattered as if someone had been looking for something. But no valuables were missing. Her laptop, wallet, and keys were untouched. Then, an officer checked Julia's bathroom. There, they found a horrible scene. Julia was lying face down in a tub filled with water. She'd been stripped, bound, and her phone was floating in the water too. Someone had cut her jeans off of her. Julia's body was already rotting. She'd been left in the cold water for three days now. The police didn't immediately notify Julia's family. Around the time they discovered her body, Kim and Jennifer were driving to Ypsilanti as Julie's Walmart colleagues had notified Jennifer about her not answering the door. But the first call Kim got from the emergency services was pretty odd. The next thing you know, I get a phone call from one of the EMTs and he says, is this, you know, Kim Turnquist, is your daughter? And I said, yes. And they're like, does she have any known medical conditions? And I said, yes. And so. I told them her medical conditions and I said, what's going on? And they're like, we'll call you back. When they got to Julia's apartment, they pushed through the security guards outside, climbed the stairs and almost made it to Julia's living room. But 
That's when a police officer stopped them and pushed them back out into the hallway. You know, Jennifer's like, what's wrong? I want to see my sister. And I'm like, what's wrong? With I want to see my daughter. And he was like, you can't see her. She's deceased. And so imagine, like, just being told that way that your daughter and then for Jennifer, your twin sister is, is deceased. This was the brutal reality Kim and Jennifer now had to face. I was in shock at, like, the worst thing that I could ever happened happened. When you have a twin, you're 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 inseparable. Hearing the news that she was gone was the worst day of my entire life. But even in that unimaginable emotional state, Kim and Jennifer had to accompany the police to the station. There, the police already had Julia's two roommates, and both of them were being questioned. When the officers questioned Kim and Jennifer, they made it clear this was a homicide investigation. Julia had not died of natural causes or any underlying health conditions. She died of something. But apart from repeating this and asking the two women if they knew anyone who could have done this, they didn't shed much light on things. What would follow was an investigation that got murkier and murkier until Julia's family took matters into their own hands. The police ruled the cause of death asphyxiation by drowning. But when an autopsy was conducted later that day, the report said she'd been strangled prior to being thrown in the bathtub. From the crime scene, the detectives retrieved a pair of bloody latex gloves and suspected seminal fluid. While the fluid was analyzed, the investigators determined that this person could not have children. There were also three DNA profiles discovered at the crime scene. One was Julia, and the other two were identified as male, but weren't linked to anyone in the police database. There was another important clue. There were no signs of breaking and entering. Whoever had visited Julia had probably done so with her knowledge. The attacker might have been someone she knew quite well. So the police started looking at the suspect pool. What men had Julia seen over her last days? First, the police discovered she'd been on a date that Saturday night. Within hours, her date was at the police section for questioning, but he was soon cleared of all suspicions and released. Then the investigator's eyes fell on Jim, Julia's stepfather. He was someone Julia knew but wasn't related to, and he had access to her EMU apartment. Then there was another strange clue. Jim had recently had a vasectomy, and the semen found at the crime scene belonged to someone who couldn't have children. If that's not a creepy coincidence, I don't know what is. But as soon as Jim became the main person of interest in the investigation, Kim and Jennifer started defending him fiercely. First of all, Kim claims there's no way Jim could have left the family home that night without her knowing. I had bl bladder issues. I have a very weak bladder, so I, you know, get up all hours of the night. So if anyone had ever left my house in the middle of the night, I would know about it because I would have been up. What about the times she would actually be asleep? Barbara Robinson believes Kim is not really a good enough alibi for Jim. Kim could sleep through a hurricane, first off. She could sleep through anything. So if she can't say for sure, she knows she was there. Kim said that she and Kim had a regular marriage and they slept together in the same bed. So she would have definitely heard her husband leave the bed if he did. But James and his wife believe otherwise. Their marriage was really strange. It really wasn't a marriage. Um, they did nothing together. She didn't spend a lot of time at home. Many times through their marriage, we'd go up there and visit, and she would come out to the door as we're saying goodbye, and she would say, I don't know how much longer we're gonna be together. Kim would say things right next to her husband, almost as if they both agreed they might break up soon. Barbara could confirm they had a pretty immature relationship. Kim and Kim's relationship I equate it to like a high school relationship. They they constantly fought, pretty much all according to Kim. That's who we would hang around with a lot or see. And they would fight, oh, we're gonna get divorced, we're gonna get divorced, they're not getting divorced. Why was Kim hiding the nature of their relationship? Why did she insist they had a normal marriage? 
Is she just embarrassed about the many fights? Is she covering for Jim? Or is she involved in another way? Sadly, the investigators couldn't answer these questions. And as weeks turned to months, turned to years, Julia Nesswender's story became a cold case. But not everyone forgot about Julia. Her grandfather, James, became particularly enraged at the police's lack of involvement and decided to pursue his own investigation. That's one of my gripes about the Ypsilanti Police Department. When it was brought up to them that they aren't using or, ha or refuse to have outside assistance, shall we say, I filed Freedom of Information Act requests and I got two different packages from them. Of course, the forms I got were all redacted. The names were missing and maybe an address or whatever, but you got I got an idea of what all's being tested. Apparently, both James and Kim spoke to the police and urged them to continue their investigation, particularly when it comes to analyzing the two male DNA profiles. But each time they contacted the officers, they refused to continue the investigation. If they were to have one nanogram of DNA, they could proceed with their genetic uh, investigation for familiar testing. Uh, Ypsilanti police have been made aware of this and they don't seem to be interested. James suspects more than laziness here. Unless they may have made some mistakes early on and they don't want the fact to get out that they they botched it from the word go. When James pressed the police about Jim as a potential suspect, the police asked Jim to take a polygraph test twice. He took a private polygraph and a polygraph from Washtenaw County, which is for Ipsy and um he passed both of them you know you got those people that say oh well polygraphs aren't admissible in court but then all of a sudden they're like oh they failed the polygraph oh well what's the matter if they fail or pass it because it's not admissible in court in your guys eyes again kim was fiercely defending her husband even though he did pass the test twice in a row but although the police seemed to be satisfied and cleared jim as a suspect james was far from it Things got a little bit more complicated when the police decided to only keep in contact with Kim rather than the whole family. This was upsetting to James, who lived in Florida. Not only did he lose access to crucial details of the investigation, but he had an awful feeling his daughter and her husband were not reliable people to talk to the police. My daughter, Kim, she thought she wasn't being informed you know, of things that were happening and everything. And uh, the chief of police came up with the idea that, well, we'll only talk to Kim from now on. That didn't make a lot of sense to me because both Kim and her husband at that time, Jim, the stepfather, had both lawyered up. They refused to give formal written statements to the police. Now, why would you, as a chief of police, why would you make this the person that you're going to talk to, you know? So why did Kim and Jim refuse to give written statements? Well, if you lie in a written statement as opposed to when you're simply talking, you're liable under the law. Does this mean they had something to hide? When Explore With Us approached Kim with this question, she responded. They had never asked for a formal written statement from myself, from Jennifer, or from Jim, my husband. They had never once asked for a formal written statement on where we were the night that Julia was killed until 2015 when they tried to pull all that crap with Jim. Did you notice her last sentence? Yeah. Skip to 2015. The Ypsilanti police were still keeping a close eye on Jim, albeit from afar. One of Julia's former friends had confessed to the police that years ago, Julia had complained that Jim had behaved inappropriately with her. While they couldn't prove this in any way, they decided to search Jim's home again and his computer. On Jim's laptop, the police found inappropriate images of minors. Sheesh. Jim was arrested, but he pleaded not guilty. The trial was a pretty short one. His defense attorney argued that Jim wasn't aware of the pictures or that the persons in the picture were underage. He said that several people in the Turnquist home had access to the laptop 
and that the images could belong to anyone. Furthermore, the prosecution couldn't determine the exact age of the people in the pictures, so the case pretty much fell apart. After 44 minutes of deliberation, the jury found Jim not guilty. But apparently this was an opportunity for the police to ask Kim for a formal statement about Julia's case too. She refused. And in 2018, the police tried again during a family meeting. James was there and he remembers his daughter refusing once more. In Barbara's opinion, Kim is shielding Jim. They say they wouldn't talk to the cops. They won't go talk to the cops one-on-one, -on -one, ever. They always go in packs. It's always Jen, Kim, Carrie, whoever else. And after she died, got a lawyer before she was ever even buried. My only thing now is if he didn't do it, like I'm trying to imagine how they would act the way they have if he wasn't guilty. Meanwhile, James's many messages and requests to the police led the detectives to block him. He was now completely in the dark when it comes to the investigation. Sadly, the rest of the family did the same to him. I have received messages basically from, uh, from Kim, Madison, and Jennifer that as far as they're concerned, I'm not their grandfather and I'm dead. Puts a hole in your heart, you know? With 2022 coming to a close, it's been a full decade since Julia's mysterious death. And sadly, the more digging people do, the more questions they get. On the other hand, there's suspicious Jim, a quiet loner with allegations of inappropriate behavior towards Julia and inappropriate pictures on his laptop. On the other hand, there's Kim and Jennifer, who are protecting his innocence. They complain that people who attack Jim only want attention from the media. According to them, they've had to suffer a lot because of this. We've had death threats, we've had, you know, we've been followed. There are times we couldn't go home for days because people would camp outside our house. It's definitely been very hard. My face would be on the front page of the Ann Arbor News, and so women would come up to me and spit on me because they would see the stories on the Ann Arbor News or their free press and say, Kim's theory is that one of Julia's two roommates was responsible for her death. She claims that Julia once complained about fighting with her. When the roommate was questioned by the cops, she said yes, they fought, but she didn't want to see Julia dead. She and the other roommate were cleared of all charges within hours, but Kim is still pointing her fingers at them. The question remains, is she protecting Jim? Is she even more involved than that? Or is something else entirely at play here? And will we ever have answers to close the case and get justice for Julia? Hey, thanks for watching. Remember to hit that like button and subscribe for more. See you next time and stay safe.